Do you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. We're continuing our focus on topics that we know are of relevance to you in these crazy times, these unpredictable times. And of course, what has dominated this show and many others has been this whole COVID-19 thing. Uh, Fortunately, we're seeing some very encouraging signs. Many of you probably have actually wandered out of your homes. But we know that a lot of people, though, are concerned from a standpoint of, you know, to what extent is it safe to be in healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, right. rehabilitation facilities? I mean, these are kind of necessary things, and and we know that many people in our audience, particularly Jill, are are concerned about the fact that they may in fact be currently staying in such a facility. Facility, they may be scheduled to go into a facility, and they they wonder to what extent is this safe? And we've heard a lot of varying stories. In the, in the national press, you know, some good and, and some bad. Of course, we know what the press is going to grab. So what better source can there be to go to those who are in the industry who can speak from the inside as to what's going on in terms of dealing with the, the virus primarily? We'll talk about some other health-related issues. But that, that's our approach today. Jill, you want to introduce our guests? Yes, and they were on our show back in October. We're so happy to have them back. We have Mark Dwyer, the CEO of the Rehabilitation Institute of St. Louis, and Ann Warren, who's now Chief Nursing Officer of Encompass Health. Uh, congratulations are in order. Just got this promotion. Yes, I did. Thank you. Well, Thank so you. you've moved up in the world since our last show. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. Very, Very excited. Okay. And right before the promotion was right before the pandemic, I understand. It was. It was. <laughs> Nothing well, like having a challenge with a new position. Absolutely. So then let's talk let's talk first from, you know, kind of a very broad perspective about the the facilities in which people find themselves staying if they're older and they've had some health issues. You all focus primarily on rehabilitation Correct. care. Uh, but can you comment on what you've seen in the healthcare industry just in the last, what, three months, four months? Well, we've continued to see a lot of patients. You know, even with a pandemic, people are still going to have strokes. They're still going to get into car accidents, although I guess not as many car accidents right now because there's not right. as much traffic. Yeah. Uh, still have spinal cord injuries. People with Parkinson's are still going to see the progression of that disease and need help with that. So you know, those types of issues. So we've actually stayed very busy during this time, but we have seen some changes in the mix of patients uh, as far as, say, the number of stroke patients coming in. We've seen a a pretty big drop-off there, and we've seen that not just locally but nationally in the literature as well. And again, it may come back. Well, I think it comes back to what you said a little while ago, Joe, in that some people during the pandemic were afraid to come into healthcare facilities. And uh, matter of fact, there was a research study done right here in St. Louis by uh, Washington University researchers in radiology on how many stroke patients were presenting to emergency departments across the country. And they saw almost a 50 percent decline during the, the height of the pandemic, you know, late March early, and throughout May. And, um, you know, it's not like everybody stopped having strokes just all of a sudden. That would be nice if they did. But uh but they saw a big reduction. So the but well, that's, that's scary. That's it is scary. dangerous it's for somebody scary. that has a stroke and they don't go and seek medical care because we yep. know, without say physical therapy after a stroke, you can suffer just damage that's not reversible. So give yes. us a give us though a, a scenario on what the theory is. Um, somebody d- describe a typical case. They may be at home and and maybe they don't completely pass out or they don't get paralyzed in a large portion of their body. Describe what symptoms they might have that they decide to blow off. Well, I mean, you just described some of them right there. Uh, You know, weakness on one side of the body, if they start to see facial droop, if they have a hard time swallowing, uh, you know, unexplained uh, muscle weakness, those types of things. Any of those types of signs might indicate that you're having a stroke. And as far as the theory from that particular research, uh, as far as why, you know, again, the the primary theory was that they were just afraid to come into a healthcare facility. 
Uh, now, it may be that somebody was having a, a maybe mild symptoms of a stroke, so they figure, well, you know, I can just live through this. Um, the more severe strokes, those are ones you're probably not going to be able to avoid right. coming those, to an emergency. Those we assume came in. sensitive. Exactly. So you only have um, so much time to, to get to a hospital and, and have them provide the care and, and give you the medications that they need to try to uh, yeah, it's stop. Yes, a narrow window. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so the the very mild symptoms, and I want to dwell on this for a minute. This is a fascinating piece of information: fifty percent reduction. And if we assume that they're in fact occurring at the same rate, because mm-hmm. um, it's hard to imagine a theory that would say that there would actually be a reduction in the strokes. I guess Correct. there's some possible theory, but assuming they're still occurring, um, these must be mild symptoms that people blow off. So maybe they just have a little bit of maybe par- paralysis, and it could just be not finding a word or slurring. Um, they've even had you know, newscasters that have actually had strokes while being on the news, and it's just like that. They stop kind of mid-sentence and just kind of stare off and then kind of move on. Maybe but at a pick slower. up. And, mm-hmm. and it's possible to ignore it, meaning yeah. for them to do that. And yes. That is very interesting. Yeah. it's But like you said before, it's also a little bit scary because like Ann was saying, if you don't get to the emergency room within a certain period of time, if it's a certain kind of stroke and there's a medication they can give you to maybe right. correct the stroke... Or maybe within 24 hours, if you're a candidate for a thrombectomy, and if you're outside of those windows, then then that medication or those procedures, you're, you're no longer, you can't get them anymore. You're not, it wouldn't work right. after it's, that it's, it's not period going, of right. time. You're not going right. to be a candidate for that anymore. So then it could extend out, you know, the effects of the stroke could be worse. The, the rehabilitation could take longer. Mm-hmm. So the, the faster you can get to those types of services. So that's why... Uh, you know, we, we advise people, if you think you're having a stroke, then then by all means, seek out the appropriate medical attention there. Don't wait. And, you know, we understand the fear factor that everybody was, was nobody really knew. We haven't been through a pandemic in over 100 years, so nobody yeah. really knew what to do. Mm-hmm. And and granted, it's a novel virus. So uh, as healthcare providers, we were all learning how to deal with sure. it as well. But at this stage, especially now, we know a lot more than we did a few months ago. We're going to continue to learn. But... I, I don't think there's a safety risk. I, I sure I know if I was having a stroke, I'd be in the emergency room in a heartbeat. I wouldn't Absolutely. be concerned at all anymore about a, uh, a COVID risk in the emergency room. I mean, we've all learned how to you know, wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. Within Take all them. the precautions. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I don't think anybody would have anything to fear from that perspective at this point. Uh, you know, we, we've learned how to handle this very well within the healthcare environment now. Let's continue that those observations then about kind of what's happened over the past three to four months. And Mm -hmm. it's funny, under pressure, we learn fast. (laughs) It's amazing how when we've looked at national crises, even like war, for example, you know, the the Japanese bet when they bombed Pearl Harbor that that it would take a year to replace those ships that were sunk. And and we know that that we we developed under necessity, we developed Mm -hmm. the ability to make ships in a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so I, a similar thing I think we've, uh, we've seen here is the, while we don't have a vaccine uh, nor therapeutic medicines, I guess they're fully reliable, still we know the rate of progress is so fast right now with so much talent mm-hmm. poured into it. So tell me what you've seen that from the, from the early days when this started among hospitals and other in-care uh, facilities that you know of, and as well as your own. Tell me how you've seen a learning curve develop during that three to four months. There's a lot of collaboration that goes Mm -hmm. on um, two, three times uh, a day. If not more. You know, yeah. Uh, These meetings about COVID and collaborating with the other major hospitals and um, just making sure that we're staying on top of the latest um, recommendations, which, I mean, especially at the beginning, it seemed like they were changing, you know, hourly. We could have a meeting in the morning, and by noon, it was, uh, they've rescinded that, and we now need to uh, do this. But a lot of meetings, uh, seven days a week, even on the weekends, to keep up um, and make sure that we were providing the safest environment for our staff and for our patients. It's amazing the progress that can be made under pressure, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so that people, uh, some of the people listening today will not recall that the the show that you were previously on, or maybe they didn't hear it. Uh, describe what what your facilities are and how many beds, et cetera. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, at the Rehabilitation Institute of St. Louis, we are a joint venture between Encompass Health, which is the largest provider of inpatient rehab in the country. We have 135 hospitals around the country and with Barnes Jewish, uh, the BJC healthcare system. And, uh, and and also we're, we're tied in with Washington University uh, School of Medicine. We have their physicians and their residents in our in one of our buildings as well. So we have 131 beds. Uh, we have a, a 96 bed facility down in the Central West End, and then we have a 35 bed uh, uh, hospital as the entire third floor of Barnes Jewish St. Peter's Hospital. Uh, our Central West End Hospital is on the campus of Barnes Jewish Hospital down there. So we provide uh, high intensity rehabilitation uh, for patients with catastrophic illnesses or injuries. So the, the the big three we call it the big three diagnoses that tend to come into our building are going to be stroke, brain injury, and spinal cord injury. But there are numerous other types of patients that come in. We see uh, a lot of trauma patients at the Rehab Institute of St. Louis uh, because Barnes Jewish is a level one trauma center. So we see a lot of patients coming over with that uh, after car accidents, uh, gunshot wounds, uh, those types of things. Other neurological conditions, like I mentioned before, Parkinson's disease other types of neuropathies and the like. Uh, we see a lot of patients at following amputation who need uh, intensive gait training, uh, learning how to use their new prosthesis. So those types of patients are coming to us. Uh, we provide a minimum of three hours of therapy five days a week. Uh, it's the only inpatient environment of any setting in the United States where you're going to get that much physical occupational, uh, occupational and speech therapy. So that's why I say high intensity. Uh, you're going to get a lot of rehab. The, the goal for us is to get you home. That's the goal of inpatient rehabilitation. Uh, that's part of the reason why this classification of care was created in the early 80s was not to create another avenue to, to have patients move into a nursing home environment. Although, you know, if that's what's required, then, then, then that's what's necessary. But to try and help people make it from the acute care hospital home. Uh, so that's what the, the high level of, of intensity is for, is so that we can provide uh, a, a short two to three, maybe four weeks tops length of stay so that we can help people make it from, say, after a stroke when they're almost nearly completely paralyzed on one side of their body. You know, the question is, well, how in the world do you expect me to walk? How do you expect me to get in and out of the tub? How, how do you expect me to get dressed in the morning? Um, we teach them how to do that. We help retrain those muscles so that by the time we, they're ready to leave from us, they are able to go home. Uh, that doesn't mean they're finished in rehabilitation. They're usually still continuing with home health or maybe outpatient therapy. Yeah, it's a long process. It's a long process. But we, we bridge that gap from making it from the acute care hospital to home. And refresh my memory, how, what percentage of your patients are seniors? Just a little over 40% of our patients are over 65, or 65 and over, sorry. In most rehabilitation hospitals, it's it's probably more like 60% are going to be 65 and older. But because of our hospital down in the Central West End, we do get enough trauma and other types of uh, that we do see uh, maybe a little bit of a younger population than most inpatient rehab hospitals. Right. Yeah. And if you're just joining us, uh, we have our guest, Ann Warren, Chief Nursing Officer of Encompass Health and Mark Dwyer, CEO of the Re Rehabilitation Institute of St. Louis. Now, during the last time you were on the show, um, you stated that your s success rate exceeds uh, – the regional and national rates. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute that to? I'd say the interdisciplinary um, approach. Uh, another part of what we do is educating the family and doing training with the family so that when their loved one does come home, um, they know the safest way to be able to assist them in transferring or um, eating, any of those activities of daily living that they need. Um, we do have like Mark said, uh, speech therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, but we also have a dietitian. Um, we have a wound care nurse if they have wounds. Um, we, you know, it starts with our liaisons that are, you know, preparing the family what to expect and case management that does such a great job at, you know, kind of keeping everything together and what are they going to need when they go home? Are they going to need special equipment? Are they going to need home um, health to come in and help them care for a wound or therapy. Mm -hmm. So just that whole interdisciplinary and having all of that in one area. Um, but there have to be some gray areas where somebody, a family member has had some sort of surgery, for example, an elderly person, and and uh, maybe it's, it's a, the result of a stroke or maybe it's a mm -hmm. result of a heart attack, whatever it might be. 
and and they are ambitious. They want to go home ultimately, but it's you know it's it's not clear. So in cases like that, they would choose a facility such as yours, for mm-hmm. example, because of this this determination on their part to make mm-hmm. it home. But there have to be circumstances in which things don't they don't rehabilitate at the rate that perhaps they and you would like. How common is it that people come, you find after weeks or a month or whatever it may be, that it's not realistic that you have them transitioning from from your facility rather than home, but perhaps to a long-term care. Does that phenomenon happen? It does, and it's probably best uh, quantified by the percentage of our patients who leave our facility and and instead of going home, go to a skilled nursing facility. Uh, This year, so far, for the uh, you know, five months that have finished on May 31st, just a little over 7% of our patients have discharged from us to uh, a skilled nursing facility. The national average is somewhere between 13 to 14%. So so we're about half what we see around the nation from that perspective. So that's good. I mean, you know, again, our goal is to try and get our patients home. A little over 80% of our patients are going home from us. So that that's definitely uh, something that we like to see. Well, have you had, you know, family members voicing concerns about that during this pandemic, about their loved one transitioning into a long-term care facility because, you know, concerns of Mm -hmm. them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would think they might feel better about that if the alternative is staying in the hospital, you know, proper. Tell me what have been people's reactions. I I think Jill hit it right on the head. I, I, you know, people are definitely motivated to go home, especially right now, because that is the safest place to be. And, uh, you know, anything that helps in, increase the motivation of our patients to, to push themselves to go home, we welcome that. You know, wh- whether or not that's been some of the determining factor for some patients, maybe so. I'm sure it's well, been a motivating factor. And to what extent were there problems with COVID-19 in the St. Louis area? We know that, you know, you hear the horror stories about, about New York City mm-hmm. where they, I think they made some bad policy decisions right. early on that, that produced some bad numbers. But uh, what about St. Louis? How does St. Louis do? I've seen the the articles in the media as far as uh, looking at cases either in, in hospitals or in nursing homes or the like. So from that perspective, I've seen the same resources that probably you have and, and others. Uh, you know, there have been cases in those facilities. There, there's been cases everywhere. I mean, hospitals have had positive cases, of course. We've had some. Uh, you know, pretty much if you're a healthcare facility, you're going to have some positive cases. But I, I definitely think it's a, like you said, it's a motivating factor for people that if they can get out of that inpatient environment, whatever inpatient environment that might be, and get back home, then that's going to be the safest place for them. And since that that merges in perfectly with what our objective, what our mission is, is to help patients recover, rehabilitate, and then make it back home so that they can continue that rehab uh, again, either on an outpatient basis or through home health. I would also say that the numbers or the stories um, in regard to the SNFs. What SNFs? Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> skilled nursing <laughs> facilities, sorry. Maybe a little bit skewed in the aspect of their entire population falls into that very high mm-hmm. risk category, whereas a regular hospital or another facility, it's not going to be. Um, everybody's at high risk. So mm-hmm. um, that also plays a part in why you may see larger numbers for um, those type of facilities because the majority of their population is at high risk. They have a lot of other comorbidities. So, um, you know, I want to be sure that there's not this kind mm-hmm. of bashing of um, sniffs and, well, what are they doing? Or they're not, you know, taking care of our loved ones. Um I, I think that they're doing everything that they can. I think mm-hmm. that it, it's just skewed because that population is almost, you know, it, and right. it's exclusive. Almost, yeah, exactly. And it's almost a perfect environment for spreading, meaning that, as you said, it's the population, but also the proximity. They're living close. You have the same – you can't have a, a set of, of caregivers for each individual, so it's the same caregivers, many of them that are serving multiple individuals. That's the nature of the, of the, the model – then it seems that it would be almost impossible that once a virus got in the door, it'd be really difficult to to keep it concentrated or limited to one person. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why everybody is is screening their employees now when they come in the door every morning. You know, you're seeing that everywhere now, uh, monitoring symptoms, monitoring temperature, so that if, if somebody is uh, symptomatic, then... 
you know, again, you don't know if, it, if it's COVID or not, but at least you can go get them tested and, and make sure so that you can provide the, the highest level of protection possible. Plus, the, the personal protective equipment supplies are much more plentiful now than they were in the early days. Uh, most of the manufacturers and the suppliers have ramped up and caught up with the demand. So those, those uh, healthcare providers now, assuming, have, have the appropriate level of, of personal protective equipment so that they can wear what they need to protect the patients from just that type of transmission you mentioned, but also protect themselves. So as to your facility, and you're probably also familiar with, with what's going on with Barnes and uh, WashU, are there tests available for their employees that, that will diagnose real quickly whether or not they either have uh, antigens or, or they have antibodies? Uh, to what extent are these tests available that give you fairly reliable information for employees coming and going? It's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, we're doing town hall meetings every every week with our employees, and our my medical director participates, uh, uh, Dr. Pratik Grover, and we get that question every single week. Where's the antigen tests? Where's the quick tests? And uh, the FDA uh, fast-tracked some of those a couple months ago, uh, but as they started to hit the market, they were finding that the results – we're not as accurate. That's my understanding. So the FDA pulled most of them back and, and are rechecking everything. We really haven't seen the proliferation of those out there. You know, we, we still primarily see the nasopharyngeal test being done, which is mm-hmm. still considered to be the best and the most reliable. There's still questions about what, what what does it really tell you if you've got antibodies? That doesn't necessarily tell you, are you still infectious or not? And, and that's where, again, the, the nasopharyngeal test is still considered the gold standard. Uh, because that that's going to tell you if you're still actively uh, got the virus. Uh, the virus and, and if you're infectious. We get test results back because our tests are run through the Barnes Jewish Hospital Lab, and we're getting them back six, eight, twelve hours. Sometimes wow, even four. Yeah, sometimes even faster. That's and they've always good. been fast. They they were fast right from the get go. But uh, but it, again, it took everybody a little while to ramp up for this because we didn't have this test, you know, four months ago. We didn't know what we were dealing exactly. with. Exactly. I mean, and so what it, kind it of has supplies been, we yeah. were going to yeah. have for that. Yeah. It's been impressive how fast, especially in St. Louis, we ramped up uh, uh, compared to some other places that we've heard about. Now, there's no way to apply social distancing when you're providing um, someone with physical therapy. Mm-hmm. So when this first hit back in March— I imagine that was frightening for mm-hmm. the physical therapist and the patient. And, mm-hmm. and how, you know, did you deal with that? We had a lot of protocols very, very quickly. I'm extremely proud of uh, how quickly um, we put protocols in place and started with the masking, the screening. Um, we went to all private rooms, um, which was not the case at our um, quick- Central West End location. Okay, how quickly did you do that? Were you able to go to all private rooms within the first month or so of the? Yeah, we did that. I think uh, we started. You know, I think St. Louis. We really started feeling the impact of it around mid March. I know we had our first incident command meeting on Saturday, March thirteenth, and uh, we went to all private rooms at our Central West End location because our St. Peter's one is already all private. Um, second week of April, I believe it was, or or very end of the first week of April. And we stayed mm. all private until May 4th. We started reverting back and converting some of the beds back to their semi-private status around then. Did mm. you have any COVID-19 cases among your patients? We did have some patients convert uh, uh, that, you know, we, we monitor symptoms of all of our patients. And so if patients started uh, exhibiting any possible symptoms, we would get them tested. And, and we have had a few patients test positive, yes. And but what happened from spread. there? So what we did is we allocated some beds on the fourth floor of our Central West End location. Right now, uh, if, if we have a positive patient, they would go to Central West End. Uh, we haven't had any of those patients out at our St. Peter's location, but we have had a few at our Central West End. So we moved them into a room that's separated, partitioned off, that has low pressure in there so uh, it doesn't push the air out into the main unit. It keeps it all in there. With a dedicated team. Right. So we have this required a lot of logistics. Oh yes. Well, and 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 you know we've got a small unit for that. Uh, can you imagine what the large hospitals had to go through? Wow. Yeah. You know, the the larger hospitals in town they they dedicated multiple units to this. 
multiple nurses, physicians, therapists, uh, and like Ann said, they, they were dedicated to those units. They, they weren't going elsewhere in the hospital. They were staying in place on those units for their entire shift. But these strategies worked then. I mean, they, they limited the spread. I would say they yes. were very successful. Yes. yes. To what extent then are facilities such as yours impacted financially? I know that I hear in Wall Street Journal and elsewhere about long-term care, how they've lost on average 10 to 15 percent of their residents and they're not sure they're coming back. Um, and these aren't deaths, I don't think. Mm-hmm. I think this is all numbers of people, just parents or families coming and getting them, taking them home. Right. Mm-hmm. In your case, families can't just come and get them and take them home, I wouldn't think, uh, because they, they do need this rehabilitation. It yes. would be difficult. Um, mm-hmm. I think that we have bounced back pretty quickly. Um, even those patients that uh, had COVID, they need therapy. They've become very deconditioned, and they need therapy to get them back. Now we're um, seeing that they're bouncing back um, very quickly, Mm -hmm. usually within that two-week period of getting therapy, they're able to bounce back and be able to go home. But um, they're going to need therapy. People are going to continue to need therapy, and some could possibly um, take their loved one home maybe in the earlier stages when work was shut down. But now that everything's opening up again, who's going to stay with mom or grandma or right. grandpa right. when yeah. you have to go back to work? Yeah, so, especially when they're at a very low level of care and need a lot of assistance because we haven't been able to finish the rehab yet. The people, though, who were tested and had the virus, I assume you had employees that were dedicated exclusively mm-hmm. to these people since you probably didn't allow them to go back and so forth. So that fourth floor again, mm-hmm. we had... COVID and post-COVID unit. So, yeah, we kept those teams separate. So you would have a a nurse for that unit and then a nurse if we had somebody that was positive. The other thing, going back kind of to the test, is, you know, we're seeing that some people can test positive for up to 45 days after recovering. It doesn't mean that they're going to be able to spread it to anyone, so but it's not still contagious. showing up. Right. They're not so contagious that kind anymore. of goes back to that test question. You right. may test positive, but do you have it now? Or did you have it two weeks ago? The antibody test, it's not specific to just COVID. It's, it's going to pick up all coronavirus. So one of the advantages that I would think your facility would have would be its relationship with WashU's School of Medicine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's. I don't know that many of our listeners appreciate the fact that we have in St. Louis what's ranked regularly in the top five yeah. medical schools in the country. Yes, which by extension is probably in the world. To the extent that that you're benefiting from the research and whatnot of their professors, mm-hmm. um, who regularly publish in JAMA, New England Journal mm-hmm. of Medicine, right. Lancet, and other, you know, highly, highly the best, the most prestigious medical publications. So that's informing your policies. Yeah, the level of collaboration with uh, the Washington University specialists, uh, with the the BJC Incident Command Team, with our own Encompass Health Team, uh, that was, you know, because they were having to provide a national response, not just a localized response. But we could take advantage of all of those different resources for our hospital. And it was amazing. I mean, the level of collaboration between all the healthcare providers in town, but especially within the BJC system and Washington University School of Medicine, uh, like I've told uh, my my company's leadership has just been so impressive. So is there there discussion uh, among the leadership in, in your facility and others regarding the prospect of a second wave? Well, I, I think we haven't gotten through the first wave yet. I think we're on the <laughs> tail end of the first wave, so we want to be careful we don't jump too fast. But, of course, you know, we've all heard that there could be a possible second wave maybe in the fall right. when flu season starts and things like that. But, uh, you know, right now I think we're focused on let's just make sure we get out of the first wave and, and don't, don't spike up again. We know what to do now. So even if things cool down over the summertime – But if we start to see cases picking up again in the fall, we just re-implement the exact same protocols that we implemented in March and April. And staff now, it's not going to be something new for the staff. They know what to do now, too. And I think the fear factor for everybody will be a little better now, too, because we all know how to respond. How has visitor restrictions impacted Mm -hmm. the patients? Has it made it more challenging with their recovery? It's been very difficult, um, not only for the patients, but for the families also. 
um, not being able to be there with your loved one. Uh, yeah. The population that we serve is a lot of trauma. And mm-hmm. I mean, nobody wakes up and says, hey, I think I'm going to have a stroke today and not be able to, um, you know, feed myself. So that's traumatizing enough right. that you're going through. And then you, you lost your independence. That you can't have you, your loved one there. And then, of course, the loved ones are at home and they're in front of the TV and they're seeing all of these horror stories and imagining all kinds of, um, you know, horrible things. So it it's taken a lot of um, time. We've put some some processes in place. We're trying to communicate with families even more than we did before. We're trying to do things like utilize um, FaceTime and Zoom, uh, making sure that, you know, every department is kind of responsible for um, assisting them to make calls home. Because, again, uh, the population that we serve, they may not be able to dial the phone. They may not be able to speak. Yeah. Which is why Zoom and FaceTime is so important because they may not be able to use their vocabulary yet. Then we do uh, still bring the family in for training, but it's, you know, a limitation to that. We don't have any other visitors um, at this time unless they're scheduled for family training. So it can be several weeks before that patient gets to physically see their loved one. It could, could be, be, depending yeah. on when the family training is scheduled for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now that protocol, though, is only implemented if if there is a virus, meaning uh, the, oh, the, yeah. the yeah. protocol now is family would have access, et cetera. They'd wear masks. And, no, is that right, true? No. Right now, visitors are restricted from the building, uh, and that's true in, in still all of the inpatient hospitals within St. Louis. Mm. Uh, so there, there are no visitors in, except for some exceptions. Like Ann said, our exception is is when, when it's time to schedule the patient for – training uh, with the family, then the family can come in just for that training. Like transporting them in and out of a car right. or something like that. Or how, to, like how that. to help them use the cane or the walker, how to help right. them get in and out of the bathroom, those types of things. Or if there's any feeding restrictions or that type of thing. We want to make sure that they're right. going to be successful when they go home. Right. Yeah. So, But prior to that, yeah, there were family members that, you know, occasionally spent the night if that's what was needed. Um, yeah, before the virus. A lot of families were there all the time. Um, and so it, it's really affected everybody, the patients, the uh, family members, and, and really even the staff, because now we have all the, the normal task that we needed to do. And now we've got to make time to make sure that we're taking these, you know, extra phone calls and, and all of that. And it's not just for one patient. Everybody's family is feeling this and every patient is feeling that. And when you're isolated, it can cause depression and all of these other Mm -hmm. things that factor into your ability Mm. to recover. I suspect, though, that families are pretty understanding, not happily. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it is this, someone called it a kind of a perfect Petri dish, you know, potentially that if you let somebody come in the facility Mm -hmm. that has the virus, the, the propensity for it to spread... So when, you know, controlling family access is, is stopping a huge doorway, I would think, into, into the, the facility for the virus. But to what extent do you think there's this pent-up demand? I would have expected that all these, whether we call it um, optional surgeries or not, mm-hmm. uh, but various things that need to be done, and there had to be many that were put on hold that were not Absolutely. considered necessary. Yep. I would have thought you guys would have a surge when they lifted lockdown to the extent they are lifted. They are now. And and I think we are seeing that surge in the acute care hospitals. Now, we don't provide surgery or that type of thing in, in our rehab hospital. But uh, the acute care hospitals, we, we are hearing that they, they are becoming very busy very quickly in their outpatient surgery departments, ambulatory care departments, those things. Because you're exactly right, Joe, that, that there was... You know, if your knee is, if you need a knee replacement in February, you still need it in the middle of April, but you're just having to hold off on it because that that surgery is not being offered until we get past, you know, uh, the initial stages of the pandemic. But so by extension, though, that would ultimately mean demand in your yes. facility too, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's why we're we're full right now. I mean, we're, we're very busy right now. Where do people go when you guys are full? 
Well, most of our patients are coming from the acute care hospital. So Anne mentioned a little while ago, we have liaisons. We have liaisons that are actually stationed in the acute care hospitals that uh, screen patients and work with the social workers and case managers in the acute hospitals and the physicians and the nurses so that when they think that, when they say, you know, we think this person's appropriate for rehabilitation, then our liaison goes in and evaluates them and, and helps them determine, is it really a good candidate? Because we provide such an intense level of therapy, we want to make sure that they're going to be successful in that environment. And, and then once the liaison says, yes, I think this is a good candidate, then they talk to one of our physicians and present the case. And if the physician says, yes, I agree, then they can come over at that point. And, you know, so many seniors have become so fearful and they're staying in their houses, sitting around, not getting exercise. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you know, can't you see that this, how bad this could be for their health. I mean, mm-hmm. absolutely. And, and, and your example, I'm, I know of one and myself, uh, an extended family member who needed a knee replacement mm-hmm. badly. I mean, this person was just limping along, could barely go from room A to room mm-hmm. B and postponed and postponed and postponed. And now I think it's scheduled. But uh, I know that there must be a lot of people who need these procedures, but they're not, they weren't technically essential. So they're placed on hold, and I suspect these people still have them on hold, meaning the patient's choosing to, out of fear, to not I think you're starting Mm -hmm. to see it um, break loose a bit. People are going out a bit more. Um, We just have to also remember the precautions that, you know, we're supposed to, to be taking and making sure that we're using social distancing and, and really all of those things that we should be doing anyway. Um, Washing you know, our hands. But, but yeah. Soap and water. Wash our hands. You know, cover our mouth when we cough. When uh, people go in and have a procedure such as some sort of surgery mm-hmm. or they're recovering from a stroke, et cetera, what is the line? Where's the line drawn between the services that are provided within the hospital? We know hospitals have, you know, rehab departments, et cetera. At, at what point does something cease to be something that's done within the hospital and it's transferred to your facility. How do you define the difference? Once the once their acute medical issue is is resolved to the extent possible, that that's usually when the physicians are thinking that the person is ready for transfer. So let's say you had a stroke, and uh, you know they're they're concerned that that we want to make sure and get everything under control in your brain. We w- we don't want the stroke to continue or what we call extend. Uh, we don't want another stroke to happen. So they're going to manage you medically to stabilize that so that the stroke doesn't get any worse. And once they're confident that that's under control, then, you know, which might be two, three, four days, I think the average length of stay in acute hospitals in the United States now for a stroke patient is three days. And then they go to another level of care. That's on average. So at that point, they if they feel like they're a, a candidate for rehabilitation, like in our hospital, and that would usually be somebody who's had a, a little more of a severe stroke. You know, if they can still walk and get around and be safe, well, chances are they're going to go home. But if, if they're mostly paralyzed on one side of their body or still having significant issues, that's usually when they would come to our facility. But is there not an option within these hospitals? For example, someone has reached the point that you describe in the acute care. It's three days, and I guess they're, they're technically their medical improvement has stabilized or maximized but now they need this therapy. Yes. Um, it, are there some hospitals who choose to provide that that next level of care within the hospital, or, or is it routine that those hospitals will send those to a facility such as yours? They'll usually transfer them out at that point because hospitals uh, take Medicare, for example. Uh, you know, you're paid for a set amount of time, essentially. Mm. So if if you keep them much longer than that time, then essentially you're providing free care. And, and granted, some, some patients are going to require more time. So every hospital finds themselves in that situation. But, uh, but th- to the extent possible, the, that's when it's time to transfer them to the next level of care. And really, truly, if the medical situation is stabilized, that's what the acute hospital is for. And now if they're ready for that intensive rehabilitation, that's what we're for. And so it is appropriate at that point to go ahead and come over to our facility so we can start working on that. And even if they still have medical issues, which a lot of our patients do, we have physicians rounding every day in our hospital so they can then take over that medical management, continue what the acute hospital or uh, the acute hospital physician started, manage the medical side, keep them stable so that the therapist and the nurses can rehabilitate them uh, and get them home. So like other medical issues like diabetes, exactly. uh, heart disease. Yeah. 
I assume since Medicare and I suspect other insurers have this policy in which once the acute phase is completed, they want them to move to the next stage. Mm -hmm. I assume that that means the cost is significantly less per day of stay in your facility than it would be in the acute care facility. Is that true? Yeah, generally so. Uh, I mean, the way an acute hospital is paid by Medicare, it's it's what's called a case rate or a diagnosis-related group. So they're paid one amount for the whole length of stay. They're really not paid on a per-day basis. So if, if you're paid for an average of three days, but you keep them six days, well, you're essentially providing free care for three days. Um, and for us, we're paid on a case rate as well, but it's a different calculation uh, to take into account a longer length of stay of approximately 14 days. So, uh, so yeah, the, the per day, if you, if you divided it out and created a per day rate, yes, it would be less expensive to come to a rehabilitation hospital. Um, but if we received the same payment as an acute care hospital, we wouldn't be able to stay in business because our length of stay is on average 14 days, not just three days. Right, right. But on a per day basis, yes. you guys are less. Yes. And yeah. you, they need the rooms also for that next acute person. Mm -hmm. So, Especially now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah stabilized exactly. is the uh, key word there. Acute is to stabilize the situation, and then we're the intermediate, the next step. And what would you want to say to seniors that have become inactive during, you know, that are at home and they're just sitting in front of the TV, um, you know, about how important it is to exercise, to take a walk? Um, to it's keep themselves so in shape. so important. To go, to, hot, to go have something checked out. Yeah. Well, well both, too. both, yeah. Really, really, no change there. I mean, <laughs> even before pan, even before the pandemic, uh, I, I think you said it a little earlier. Use it or lose it. Use it, it or lose it. And as we right. age, that is so so true. The research out there is so clear cut that the more you exercise as you age, the stronger, the more mobile you will be, the, the fewer health problems you will have. I mean, there's research out there showing that if you start strengthening at 92 years old, you can still build strength. There's, a, there's the old thing that as you get older, you're going to get weaker no matter what you do. That's false. And it's mm -hmm. proven false. Mm -hmm. So um, even outside of the pandemic, but especially now, Jill, like you said, when everybody's being told, stay at home, stay inside, yeah. you know, at least just get outside and walk around your neighborhood. At right. least you know, get out and walk. around the yard. block. Right, just walk. Uh, I've got an elderly next-door neighbor, around. and, and he, he started walking all the way down to the corner uh, with his little dog, with his walker. And uh, he didn't used to do that because he used to, you know, get in his car and go drive somewhere and, you know, walk around. Right. But, but you know, even now he's doing that. And it's like, yeah, way to go, Art. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I would encourage everybody to do that. Uh, you know, be creative. Figure out a way to be active even, in, even with this situation going on. So, and, and I guess you would certainly say then that people who have had these procedures done, uh, whether they end up in a rehab facility or not, that, that data supports the idea that if you conscientiously in a disciplined way do some sort of rehabilitation, follow the prescribed exercises, uh, that the, the differences clearly show statistically a better outcome. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The research is very clear there. Boy, we're running out of time here. This con <laughs> this this conversation no, so fast. has gone fast, just like last time. It's the reason we like to have yeah. you guys back as guests. In 30, 45 seconds or less, um, there's a big difference between people who commit to them to the exercise program, the rehabilitation program, versus those who don't. I mean, the data makes that clear. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the, the more people can participate, the more people are motivated to participate. Then then yes, they 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 will do better. The better the outcome. Yes. Yeah, and so many people just are skeptical about that. <laughs> And, I know. And, and they, they tend to blow off those instructions about what to do. One thing good about rehab is they need to they're, – they're required to participate, right, to stay in rehab. Yes. Yes, yes they, they, if, if they can't participate, then that is one of the conditions for discharge. Yes. Uh, but that's, that's why true. we screen them so heavily because we want to make sure that, 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 you know, they can succeed. Well, time has flown. Our guests, Ann Warren, Mark Dwyer, uh, Mark Dwyer, CEO of the Rehabilitation Institute of St. Louis, and Chief Nursing Officer of Encompass Health is Ann Warren. Uh, the time has flown. Lots of information. Yes. We're going to have to have you guys back in the future. Always yeah, a pleasure when you absolutely. guys join us. Thank yeah, you well, so thank much. Thank you so much. And we'll, we we're happy to come back anytime you'd like us to. So this has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next week, take care.
You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.